This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. My guest this week is Jonathan Shepherd, a political lobbyist who somehow fell into becoming the holder of two national plant collections, Hollyhocks and Cosmos. Jonathan talks about how to grow Hollyhocks and Cosmos what you can or can't do about rust, good varieties to try, and what to look out for in the coming year in terms of new varieties and colours. Jonathan begins with the tale of how he came to take over the collections. Oh, crikey. Uh, yeah, that's that's a big question. I guess, you know, let, let's take, we're, we're, we're sort of in autumn uh, 2021. If we rewind literally only 12 months ago, if we rewound to the start of September, there'd be no national collections here. So it's in one way, it's, it's, it's you know, 12 months on to today, it's happened quite quickly. How, how it started, I guess, that start at the start is always a good place to, to, to begin is, uh, I went to Hampton Court, not a regular visitor, uh, myself and my wife went and we bumped into some uh, lovely uh, ladies uh, on the plant heritage site and we were having a chat and they were talking about you know what they do and why they do it and and it became apparent that they were on the lookout for national collection holders of many different types of plants and so I was going down the list and, and I saw oh, you know no one's done hollyhocks and oh, no one's done cosmos and First of all, that was a huge surprise to me because in my mind, you know, they were, whilst obviously they're not native sort of UK, British plants, they're, they're very much regarded as, I guess, you know, cottage garden type favourites. So I assumed someone would have done this. And, and, and the short version of it is that, that sort of after that conversation, I knew I'd grown hollyhocks just for fun and I'd grown cosmos just for fun. Uh, I decided to have a go. Uh, because in my mind, what's the worst thing that, that could happen? You don't get a national collection, but you grow uh, a lot of nice flowers. There. So I, I grew them for fun. So the, the, the first one I took on uh, were the hollyhocks. And I think in my mind, I did that because uh, I think they're harder to grow that, than cosmos. They can be uh, a little bit awkward at times. So even though the, you know people tell me they'll sell seeds anywhere and they'll grow in cracks, which, which is undoubtedly true, at the same time, because we, we live near near farmers, I always got advice from, from a sheep farmer who told me that when he looked after sheep, his job was keeping them alive because sheep do everything that they can to die and his job was to keep them alive and i thought you know there's a bit of a parallel there with with hollyhocks and certainly with rust is that you know it's it's often trying to die and you're trying to sort of keep it as as good as possible so i did lots of research uh sourced lots of seed so both my collections are grown from seed uh, which is which is perhaps quite different to, to some other collections where you know when someone's got a collection of established trees or perennials that can be quite a different task and then the, the, you know fast forwarding that that i was awarded the national collection of alciers of hollyhocks last september and then this june i was awarded a national collection of cosmos no less so there's uh if you look at the hollyhocks uh i'm growing 70 different uh ones and i say ones because about several of them aren't included in the collection because they're a mix of seed i've grown i think you know it changes sort of as i discover sort of new ones of the cosmos bipinatus i think i've got 66 different ones uh although i've done apricotta which came out this year so that'll be added to it for next year and they both done the, the hollyhock collection in its second year was better than ever it was massive just just amazing rust was less of an issue this year than i've ever had which was surprising given the weather and the cosmos d- did really well so kind of it was literally i had a go <laughs> brilliant <laughs> well i mean i think that when i interviewed someone from plant heritage a while back i went through the collections and i thought i can't believe nobody's growing hollyhocks but then again i had the same thought as you well actually they are quite prone to rust so I know a lot of people would go, okay, hollyhocks, rust, and you've said that you do have that problem, and I'm assuming you maybe have it slightly more because you've got so many of them in one place. Is there anything that can be done about it? Yeah, well, when, so it's really interesting because there's several things that, that, that always get 
thrown, I guess, at me in a nice way. This isn't, isn't any criticism if, if they know you're growing hollyhocks. Uh, you know, one is that what I always mentioned. Oh, they, they, they're growing cracks. Well, yeah, thank you very much. That's that's not necessarily the the, the best place for me to try and grow so many different cultivars. Uh, but yes, they do, as do other plants, I point out. Uh, and then they'll say, I can't grow hollyhocks. So I'll purposefully say, well, what do you say? So next door neighbor, can't grow hollyhocks. Don't know why you're doing that. I can't grow them here. Well, what do you mean you can't grow them? Oh, well, they get rust. It's like, oh, hang on, hang on. And that's a different thing, isn't it? That's not that you can't grow them. That's perhaps that you can grow them and you get rust and you might not like the dis- the, 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 the foliage. So, so there's several things I say here to people is to manage their expectations. If you're thinking of growing a plant that's going to look perfect throughout its whole life cycle, hox might not be for you. If you've got a really, really small garden, uh, and therefore, because of the rust issue, hollyhocks might not be for you, but there's still ways of, of, of dealing with hollyhocks. So this is what I say. Expect that they will get rust. Manage your expectations. Then if they don't, you're pleasantly surprised. If they do, uh, this this is what I do, and mine still still get rust. You can grow what's called you know, rust-resistant varieties. So Altia, Fissifolia, the fig leaf ones, are meant to be more resistant to it. But it doesn't mean they won't get it. It just means that they won't die sort of within the first couple of years from it, whereas others may weaken and, and be more susceptible. Uh, planting them as you know as far apart as possible, which is quite a struggle when you're doing a national collection. Uh, that's hard. Uh, my my top tip is when you see any kind of infection, remove the foliage and dispose of it, uh, but not on your compost pile. So I know lots of people these days are, are wary for health reasons about burning uh, any plant material. But if you live in the countryside, using uh, an incinerator and burning sort of rust infected foliage is, is probably more acceptable in the middle of towns or get rid of it in your your council uh, garden waste uh, bin that's that's the best advice if it's you know a really really bad infection so so i would collection there's there's reasons for keeping it alive i would never say that i wouldn't use a something like a rose clear uh treatment on it but i'm wary about giving that advice because we all know that these kind of treatments can impact on pollinators so for me that is very much a last resort and then the third piece of advice is if you're learning to live with it you know remove the leaves so the plant can look a little bit funny but it's, it's then how you plant it so if you plant it at the back of a border and underplant it with you know whatever takes your fancy underplant it with dahlias you'll still have this spire that comes with amazing flowers so fine you might have had to pull the infected leaves off but it, in my mind it's no different than when people say you know they're alliums and their leaves go all tatty it's part of the plant don't fret too much about it. It's not something that's going to look perfect with foliage. Remove it. It's got that infection. That helps deal with it and helps stop stopping it spread and stops it spreading in, in future years. And accept the plant for what it is with, with this fault that actually still has no cure. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Is anybody working on a cure? Uh, not that I know. Anybody who wants to tell me, is there a cure? That would be fascinating. But it's very interesting. It's so, so as I say, this year I had a whole. We, you know, we're fortunate enough to that we moved to Lincolnshire for the very purpose that at the time land was cheaper than a lot of other places, and we got a two-acre plot. Very fortunate uh, in that sense. Uh, though, as I say to many people who, who sometimes have a small garden and want a massive one, be careful what you wish for because there are pros and cons of both having small and large gardens. Uh, so I'm in that way fortunate enough that I. I, I've done the national collection in more of a almost a scientific formal setting on a grid like setting with each different cultivar with a little one one meter square bed and also in in actually growing in bins because rabbits are a huge issue here. But at the same time, I've broadcast so this year uh, a one meter stretch uh, wide by about I'd say about 30, 40 meters down the edge of the plot. And let thistles grow in the middle of it. Uh, and it's amazing that the hollyhocks there is almost like a naturalized planting. Probably were a better example of what hollyhocks can look like than the actual collection that was, you know, having to be staked up and all the rest of it when the winds came. 
uh, and the rust didn't seem to impact it so much. And maybe that's because it's airborne and the, the, the thistles and all the rest of it almost protected it from, from the disease that, that when, it, when it's being blown around. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, so you mentioned um, uh, fissifolia. Are there any other varieties that you would grow if that is a problem for people? <laughs> I would say it's, it's generally from, from what I know, you know, there's, there's I think there's uh, Antwerp, which is also, I think, a uh, fissifolia type one. As I say, but I, I take photographs because I think you know, when you're doing this kind of stuff, you shouldn't just show uh, the plants at their best. You should show, you know, when this kind of stuff happens. What 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 it does is that that it just, you know, it it it, it seems to cope with the disease better so it doesn't just wipe it all out and the plant kind of shrivel up and die and look at an atrocious mess so those would be you know and there's plenty of you know there'll be fissifolia yellows and you'll be you'll be, you'll, you'll be able to notice them if even if you get some self-seeded ones because as i say that the, the leaves do it's what i said sort of in the name it's called a fig leafed hollyhock it looks almost like a fig leaf and they do seem to cope better but sometimes i do think sort of people read rust resistant and they assume that they're getting something that won't get rust it might not you know that there'll be that some of my hollyhocks have hadn't had a bit of rust and you kind of scratch your head and wonder well, why has this one got it and why has that one got it but perhaps you know given that the last two years that we've had we could say the same with with covid some people get it some people don't some people suffer really badly from it and some some don't perhaps you know and i'm no expert on 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 it as a disease in the sense that that as I say, sort of having done all the research, I haven't particularly found a cure. That there's ways of again dealing with it. You know, I should add that I'll, I'll give the plants uh, a seaweed foliar feed uh, just and and I, you know put biochar into the soil because the advice I, th- I think is that if you can give your plant certainly with a hollyhock the chance to be a, its strongest plant as possible in terms of health then it's you know it's likely to fend off any disease that's there and say uh, that the rust is around rust travels in the air it's around i'm never going to be able to avoid it so i pretty much learned you know you have to learn to live with it and you still get some great looking flowers you mentioned then as well that some of them may be short-lived if they get a particularly bad bout of it um are they i I mean i think sometimes they're advertised as biennial but are they more short-lived perennials i i I, when people ask me because i mean online you get you get uh people having uh great debates about the one bit that they've read on google the the way i i portray hollyhock is i'll say it's it's often been listed as biennial it's called short-lived perennial and that's kind of how i treat it and then then, you know people say and, and they're right you know my hollyhocks comes comes back year after year and and absolutely i've got some hollyhock nigras that, that absolutely come back year after year it isn't the the, the fact that they're seeding because the a round here the seeds you know unless they're isolated would all cross pollinate and they wouldn't they certainly wouldn't come back uh, the same color so in my mind the advice i give is treat it as a short-lived perennial so ones that i will be sowing this autumn I sow them this autumn in the hope, and, and generally it happens that I will get flowers next year. So I'll get flowers within a 12-month period, but it's over two calendar years. So it's going from the autumn of one year into the spring and summer of the next year. Uh, I would hope that a lot of those will and will come back, and they do come back. But as I say the prevalence of rust means that there's, and, and indeed other pests, including plenty of wildlife, is that there's going to be some attrition. It's not like, as I say, that you know you're, you're growing something like a really hardy shrub that you know once you've got it, uh, it's totally bulletproof. They're not as plants that that I could, uh, and it's almost that, that can be no explanation. I could have one square meter plot where you know all five that were in it come back, and then the next one you're thinking, well, why why are three of those gone? But it, you know, it could be rust. It could be just different soil conditions. Did I put different compost down? Did the birds pull three of those up or the rabbits chew three of those up or the moles push three of those up? It's There's so many variables, which is why I enjoy gardening, that you think you've done the same thing and you definitely haven't, which is why you get a different result. If they self-sow, do they tend yeah. to revert to a particular colour? Oh, well, interesting. I, I, th- I think on the whole... Uh, because there's just a lot, it's sort of more so in that kind of colour band. They 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 tend towards eventually all sort of going towards the, the pinkish type colours. But that being said, because I've again with this 
with this uh, national collection, and I've tried to sort of get as many different cultivars as possible, the the cross bred seeds that I broadcast sowed, uh, you know, I get loads of yellows, pinks, pinks with white centers, which are obviously crossbred from all the halo varieties because they have a different colored center. And and to me, it's just, it's almost the, the perfect pastel look, which I quite like. Yeah, definitely. And also you said about sowing them now, if you were yeah. to do that, how would you overwinter them? Well, so, so, the hollyhocks that are outside, obviously, they stay outside. So at this time of year, again, I've, I've collected pretty much most of the seed and I, I'll be going out and, and chopping them to the base. So they, they you know, they, the ones that are outside and even in containers, they stay outside and, and they're perfectly happy. Uh, what I think we all, all want from a seed, you know, a lot of people say, well, just do what nature does. Well, that's not always the best thing because with nature and i know for example just from one hollyhock in my front garden that uh there may be a chance i might be able to name if if i can prove that it's very sort of different from everything else that's produced 2000 seeds minimum uh in nature you're not going to get 2000 of those germinate that's why it produces so many seeds so for me i'll sow them in cells now i'm again fortunate enough to have a, a polytunnel i'll pop them on into seven centimeter uh pots and that's where they'll overwinter. And it's not particularly because that they won't, you know, it's not heated. It's not that they won't survive the weather. It's just the fact that that if there's any fresh new growth, if I leave them outside living where I do rawly, something will pull them up, eat them up, and just, just destroy them. Uh, and that's just the nature of what will happen, uh, which, again, comes back to that's why, you know, plants seed so much and have so many seeds. It's because then there's, they hope that one or two will survive those conditions. So they're kept in an unheated place or just a sheltered spot, frankly, would work, and they will get planted out next year. Yeah. And also I was thinking about your varieties then. How do you ensure that yours don't cross-pollinate and become kind of pink? <laughs> yeah. So uh, initially, so I've, I've, I've sourced enough seed initially to probably have kept the <laughs> – kept the collection going for well over a decade but what and 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 you know we're fortunate enough to have uh, uh gardeners world came and filmed and they were laughing because uh and it was it was probably the biggest compliment and i i've had uh, and they wouldn't have realized it that the the, the the film crew uh was saying they'd never seen so many bees in one place uh and they were just laughing because obviously they know about about plants probably far more than i do they were saying you've got no chance of isolating mm -hmm. these plants and it's a tough job and so from from and from that respect again because it's literally only in its second year of existence i had to leave everything from last year to work out to start doing the notes to say well which plants did come back which didn't and part of the job of isolating it has involved me well, my wife helping me what's called enviro mesh, which frankly isn't that environmentally friendly because it's it's made of plastic, but but it gets used time and time again. And slipping them over, uh, in one way, it perhaps is easier than other plants. Slipping them over almost the tower of uh, hollyhock buds before they open up, tying it so the insects can't get in, and then t I've been tickling them with uh, a cotton bud. Uh, to pollinate them myself, uh, and then with the with the view of of seeing if those seeds come true, and that's part of the process. That that in one way, you know, na a national collection isn't there just to you know, hey, look, I've got a national collection. It's be it, it's learning about uh, a type of plant of which no one else is doing the work, and, and and I include sort of the RHS in that. You know, I've been having conversations with the RHS because I've discovered, or I think I've discovered, that certain named varieties are in fact the same plant. And I, you know, and it's almost there's no one really to pass that on to because they haven't got the time to police it. And and frankly, who cares if you're looking for a black hollyhock? You probably don't really care about what the name is. But when you're trying to protect, protect, and you know, for for future generations, specific cultivars, it's quite important what the names are. The best hollyhock I ever saw, and I'm sure you've heard this story a million times. It was growing in France in a gravel driveway, and it was yep. massive and beautiful. Yep. Had barely any rust. Um, is that the sort of conditions they like? Do they like dry and well drained? Yeah, no. This is this is this is where I I and people per, people who know me purposely always throw at me. Oh, you know the best ones they grow in a crack in the pavement. 
as I, as I previously mentioned. That drives me nuts, and they know it does because okay, I, I, I get what you're saying because in one way they're trying to just go me into look. There's no point you molly, mollycoddling these plants because look, they do their best on their own. I think that can apply to a lot of plants to be fair that the, the best one in the crack is the one that's the toughest and the ones that survived however where what i do think is interesting because i've got some growing in gravel is uh the, certain parts of those conditions are absolutely what the hollyhock needs that actually i just can't replicate for a national collection so in my mind uh i tested this in my uh polytunnel i sowed some and didn't water them and it gets up to when the doors have been closed in the summer, it gets up to 70 degrees Celsius in there. And they looked amazing. So one lesson is if they're growing in the ground, they'll find their own water. You don't need to be drowning them. And actually, the water may help spread the rust. Then what I learned in the actual national collection part, which is in these one centimeter square beds, they don't get watered, the ones that are in the ground. But where they suffer there is that because they grow so tall, irrespective of all what you try and do with stakes they rock and they actually move huge bits of earth which doesn't particularly do the plant very good whereas ones that are in cracks or indeed in gravel have got this weight and it helps them not move so for my mind you get a straighter plant it looks better uh, it doesn't particularly have water you know gathering around its feet which i don't think it likes uh, and I think those that kind of condition can help. So that's why my suggestion is, look, the, the ideal place is absolutely probably the back of a border could be next to a brick brick wall growing along your, your, your fence line. Hollyhock will love that. Obviously, you've got 70 varieties. Are there any that you would particularly recommend to anyone who was a bit nervous about growing them? Yeah, there's, there's, I've got, I mean, you shouldn't have favourites. And I always say that, and I believe this, that, that I think, Every plant, irrespective of hollyhock or not, you know, I don't just grow hollyhocks, that has its chance to shine in your garden. That that it might be at its best for a month, a day, or even just one minute. So as we know with poppies, that a, a gust of wind comes along and, and it's gone. But for that one minute, it's it's your absolute star in the garden. For me, the hollyhock that I always come back to uh, are some of the halo varieties. And I think they were bred by, uh, not that long ago, by, by Thompson and Morgan. Uh, halo peach, I just love. It's not too tall, uh, as a lot of the halo varieties don't grow as tall as some of the others. Uh, halo peach, isn't it, to me, isn't actually that peachy. or It's almost, it's just slightly more rich than a halo cream. So it's come on beyond cream. It's got sort of yellow and a slight peachy tinge, but not too much. That's one of my favorites. And then I always go back to, I never used to grow doubles, as in sort of the, the double hollyhocks that, that William Chater was a famous breeder. And there are various Chaters doubles, but there's also one called uh, Peaches and Dreams, which to me is, uh, and I know people are often aghast that I say this, but I think it's as good as a peony. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. And I know people then say, you know, you should grow singles because the bees love singles. That's absolutely true. But I, I've got more evidence. It takes them a bit longer, but they absolutely love going in the doubles and they often end up sleeping inside them. So, you know, it's not that it's not a benefit to insects either. Uh, I find, I, I, I'm I just always, every time I go down down the plot, those are the two that I, that I say that I'm drawn to. A lot of people will like Nigra, which is, which is you know, one of the most black-looking plants uh, I, I've, I've seen, but it can be quite a contrast. So, you know, that's very Marmite for some people that, 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 that they don't like that. But, you know, there's so many to choose from. But I say it's I would definitely, you know, Halo Peach and, and Peaches and Dreams uh, are two of my favorites that, that you know, if, if I had to grow some, that's what I'd be saying. You could they're easy to germinate from seed is my view that they can be harder to look after in the sense that, you know, if somebody follows the, the, the official instructions, they may well sow them, uh, let's say, you know, sometime next year, and only then will they realise that they might not get a flower next year because they've sowed it next year. And and then, you know, hollyhocks are susceptible to what we said. You know, that there is a disease that, that attacks hollyhocks, where, whereas for some other plants, you know, they're a lot easier to look after. But I think the reward uh, is immense in the sense that, you know, from a packet of 50 seeds, you can get some some monster big plants. And at the same time, uh, if it's something you're interested in, you will never be short of seed again. 
No, and they are, like you say, such good value plants and so easy to germinate. So they make a brilliant, especially like if you're not that into gardening and you don't have very good knowledge or maybe children, I think they're a perfect plant for them. I mean, I mean what I'd add with to, to that is, you know, if you, if you do, do buy a packet of seeds and, and you know, you, you don't want to do all the, you know, the overwintering and stuff, broadcast sowing works. I mean, to, to the extent that, that, you know, because of where I live, you know, there are lots of uh, what I would call countryside pests that, that will really, and that's fine. I, my garden's open to all wildlife, so it's, it's, it's not something I moan about, but it's something I'm aware of that, that you know, the rabbits will, will have a good test of anything, even plants that are poisonous to them, uh, anything that touches their nose, they'll have, they'll have a little go at. Uh, but, you know, if, if you're in a more, I guess, more secure type, garden you buy a packet of let's say even just 20 seeds and and, and direct sow them into uh a, you know a weeded border you'll get some decent hollyhocks out of that yeah they're brilliant um and then talking of plants that are easy to cultivate uh i wasn't going to ask you too much about the cultivation of the cosmos um i thought maybe we could talk about um some new varieties that might be coming out or some ones that you particularly like again because i noticed that there are Kind of every year there seem to be a few that pop up. So I think the cupcake ones have been quite popular this year. But is there anything else? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, again, if, if I talk about my, my favourites, again, it, it can change that, that this year I, I liked Exenia, even though a lot of people said it didn't perform very well for them. That, that was amazing. And, and actually uh, Capriola, which was, you know, I'd describe it as sort of white in the middle and almost this, bubblegum pink on the outside quite in your face what came out this year which i just had a couple of packets of but it's it's now been uh taken on certainly by the likes of uh mr fothergill as one of their new for 2022 cosmos is apricotta uh and i want to grow uh, i've grown I've got got about four or five plants that grew this year uh, I just think it looks really, really nice. And then at the same time, I mean, it comes back to part of the national collection is is being honest and saying, you know, you know, varieties that didn't particularly work for you. Now, it's not necessarily that they might be bad varieties; it might not just work for me. So, I always say that I preferred as as yellow cosmos bipinnatus. I always prefer. I thought lemonade was a much better cosmos than xanthos. Xanthos for me was just always a little bit fiddly. And you had to spend so much time deadheading that that you know you probably you know lose the will to live. <laughs> Whereas lemonade, they were just seemingly, or indeed Kiro, which is another yellow, uh, much sort of bigger flowers. But that might just be this is the problem. That might just be my personal preference. So what I always say to people is, you know, give it a go because what 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 I like, you might not like, and that's again the joy of gardening. Yeah. We don't all need to we don't all need to like the same thing. No, I think I do agree with you. I think Xanthos was a little bit more wilder looking, maybe, whereas Lemonade was definitely very showy. Um, interestingly, I did grow Xenia and I had this is one of the things about Cosmos that I find they are very variable within the seed packet. So some of them did absolutely nothing, whereas some looked really stunning. And another one that I grow quite a lot is purity and some of the plants are like seven and a half foot tall while others are maybe five foot tall <laughs> and not as wide so you know you never quite know what you're getting with a packet of cosmos seeds yeah and and and, and you know to be fair to like the, the seed breeders and all the rest of it you get rogue and this is what I mean, you get rogue seeds uh, and, and all the rest, I had one and I can't remember the variety but I should have done because it frustrated me no end I probably sowed from different packets you know, I'll, I'll do a batch of 15. Then I did another. I had zero germination, not even, you know, 50%. And finally got about three plants. And and whether, you know, that's down to the seeds, the variety, the, the, the people that are selling it, you, you, you just, all, all I can do is note it. And at some point as a collection holder, you may say, look, we're not, we're not keeping that in the collection because it's almost, it's not a viable plant. There's no obligation. To kind of to grow everything because as we know if you looked at sweet peas throughout history there's probably been about seven thousand different named ones mm. I, I know i know that the national collection holder won't be growing them all uh you know so, some plants uh you know go out of existence because of the threat of fashion and things others go out of existence just because they're not that good a plant when they were bred mm. and people don't want them and that's not necessarily a bad thing in life no 
Um, just a quick question about the cultivation of Cosmos. I do sometimes find that they self-sow around the place. Do yeah. they come true from seed and, and is self-sowing uh, quite a regular occurrence? Uh, you, would, uh, you wouldn't believe what I did last week. I, I put online that uh, I told my wife I was going out hoovering and then in a quiet voice I said, I'm hoovering up the seeds where the National Collection uh, was. Uh, I suspect from... Uh, they will cross, so they won't necessarily come true. That's the first sort of answer. I suspect I've now got having uh, – I, I grew a patch of what I'd describe as probably 80, me 80 square metres, so it was 20 metres by 4 metres of plants that were just a mix that I didn't deadhead for the flowers, didn't water, just left them. It was the most amazing part of my garden. The bees loved it. But then what I did, I collected all the seed just to create my own personal seed mix. I suspect I've probably got 200,000 seeds having weighed them and worked out how many they are. I think it'll make a nice mix. But I, there's in no way can I guarantee really what those seeds will look like. Which I, if, if it's a seed mix, I think that's wonderful. Uh, I was told by another grow that the way, uh, and I can't remember whether she said this was being done in Holland or Portugal, the way they had essentially grown the specific varieties of cosmos was that each specific cosmos had its own greenhouse just for growing that and so you know those are the lengths that actually go into growing uh you know to make sure that this the the, the packet of seeds that you get is is the is what comes out of the packet and that's what you should expect to get yeah, I mean, it's it's a fascinating experiment and, and it's really good if you can just get a batch and then you're not sure what's coming out. It's sometimes frustrating when you're trying to plan a border, but it's also nice when you get a pleasant surprise. So I can I can see that. But if people wanted to buy seeds from you, are you selling them at the moment? Yeah, I've got uh, a little blog, uh, which, and again, all, yeah, we, we put some on and we, we're just, on the whole, it will be seed mixes from the two national collections. Uh, it's just just a bit of fun, and th and this is this is no complaint because sometimes I, th I know people will say, well, you know, you didn't have to do it. The cost of doing this national collection ended up being uh, slightly slightly more than I thought it was. Because, as I say, because we had uh, when we planned to join lockdown, certainly the, in its first year, all the hollyhocks went out, and probably two days later, you couldn't see a piece of green because it comes back to it wasn't it wasn't I wasn't joking where the moles had pushed them out from underneath. Uh, the blackbirds had pulled them, and then the rabbits had scalped them. So I had to, yeah. So I had to do an, and I, I, I'm sure they did, were wondering why I'd done it. I had to do an emergency order of black bins, the old-fashioned sort of bins that you'd get that you put your rubbish in, sort of 90 liters. Uh, you know, 100 of those. Well, that's over a thousand pounds. You know, so it's a one-off. So, but the cost of of, of doing this as these two national collections hasn't been insignificant so we we put a few packets of seeds online and and the money goes to hopefully uh keeping and expanding and 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 keeping the national collection and learning more about it and you know protecting some of the varieties because some of the certainly some of the hollyhocks are regarded as plants under threat that that you know it's it's getting rarer and rarer to see various cultivars being grown by nurseries as i say we're, we're not a nursery I'm you know, just an individual. It's done in my spare time, uh, but we're trying to learn about these these two different types of plants uh, and, and and almost be this repository of knowledge so that, you know, when I pop my clogs, uh, hopefully in a long time, uh, there'll still be some of these varieties around. Yeah, well, I think you're doing a great job. Um, would you recommend having a national collection to anyone? I would, and and, and, and I guess there's, there's several reasons. You know, it, com it comes back to, I always have the philosophy that, that any achievement starts with the, the decision to try. Uh, their plant heritage is the charity who is, are always on the lookout of for, for willing people. Uh, so it doesn't always have to be as, as big a scale as mine. And by that, I mean, you know, you're going to need a lot of space to grow a lot of hollyhocks. That's, that's just the nature of the beast. But that's why I took it on, because I knew I'd got the space. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with it? You know, the alternative is that at some point, again, when I'm gone, someone will probably build a load of houses on it or whatever. So I thought this was a much far, far better thing to do. I would recommend it because I think they're a really supportive charity. So they've got this wealth of knowledge uh, that, that they're just wanting, uh, I guess, sort of willing 
volunteers so that you know you can go to their website you know just type plant heritage into google you'd find it and you'll find a list of plants that haven't got a national collection now you imagine if you're listening to this and then you say well, crikey i love growing that my challenge to that person would be which is what i gave myself what have you got to lose give it a go the worst that will happen is that you will learn a little bit more about that plant. You'll have a, I assume you'll have a, a go at growing a few more different varieties of it. And who knows, you might get a national collection. There you go. Thank you, Jonathan, for the interview. And thanks as always to you for listening. Here's Dr. Ian Bedford talking about what must be our biggest and most harmless airborne bugs. The astonishing aerial acrobatics of dragon-like creatures as they chase, capture and devour hapless little flying insects across the summer sky never fails to amaze me. But thankfully though, they're not fire-breathing dragons of ancient myths and legends, but are the incredible four-winged insects that we call the dragonflies. However, the dragonflies and their cousins, the damselflies, would certainly have been a common sight when those stories of damsels in distress and gallant dragon slayers were being relayed a thousand or so years ago. Since they're a highly successful group of invertebrates that were one of the first winged insects to appear on Earth. And fossil evidence reveals that despite early dragonflies being giants with 30 centimeter wingspans, they've hardly changed in appearance since those prehistoric times. But over the past 300 million years, they certainly honed and perfected their flying skills, evolving to become probably the most adept airborne predators within the insect world today. And here in Britain, we have over 30 different species of dragonfly, which, although similar in appearance to their damselfly cousins, are larger with stouter bodies and have wings that always remain open when at rest. They're also much stronger flyers than the damselflies, who tend to flutter like a butterfly. Taxonomically, dragonflies are in the order called Odonata, which means toothed ones, and it relates to their sharp serrated jaws that slice up their prey. And they have what are thought to be the most highly developed eyes of the insect world. Huge eyes, each with 30,000 individual lenses that provide almost 360 degrees of excellent vision. Perfect for seeing prey on the wing, judging its speed and trajectory before snatching it mid-air, then briefly landing to devour it. Often catching hundreds of small flying insects throughout the day, the dragonflies become major predators of mosquitoes and midges during those summer months. But alas, this onslaught doesn't last for long, since dragonflies only live for a week or two. But it's long enough for them to find a mate and initiate a further generation of their species. So whilst the males live out their final days catching food and skirmishing with rival males above the breeding grounds, the females lay their eggs into ponds and gently flowing streams. Eggs that soon hatch into larvae that live underwater for around two years, snatching and devouring many different aquatic invertebrates, tadpoles and even small fish. Then when fully grown, they emerge from the water, climbing up vegetation where they shed their skins and reveal the next generation of dragon-like creatures that'll hawk, dart, skim, and chase across the sky once again on those sunny summer days. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.